uh, based on on this uh, algorithm, this optimization algorithm, ResNet. So, uh, what is interesting about these, um, uh, what, it, what is interesting about this this review is that it provides not just uh, biological criteria that have been used in prioritization uh, studies, but also socio-political uh, criteria. So we have the uh, usual suspects or the uh, biological criteria that we probably have in mind um, over here, but then um, criteria that uh, we as biologists may not be may not be that familiar with or may have not thought about including in in a prioritization analysis. So I think this review is very good in providing a broad uh, a broader uh, understanding of uh, how prioritization is done, how diverse the, uh, the, the criteria can be, and they should be uh, more than just biological criteria. Oh, sorry. sorry. Well, what was CAN and CAN? Uh, conservation <laughs> Area Network. <laughs> sorry, cr criteria used in Conservation Area Network design. Yeah, it's, uh, we use Conservation Area Network, we use Reserve Network, we use, uh, uh, what am I missing, Protected Area Network. We use <laughs> several... Um, several words to basically say the same thing. But yes, I, I think this is a good paper, a good uh, review paper to consider, uh, Emily, if you want to uh, start working on ResNet. Okay, now the next algorithm. Uh, yes. Yes, of course. Uh, I'll come over there. <laughs> yes. I'm trying not to rush and step over some cables. Yes. So under the biological criteria mm -hmm. when we say shape what 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 sort of shape very good you? question very good question so over there you see shape and that has to do with the shape of the area that will be included in this uh, prioritization um, network why is that important think of the edge effect so if we have a shape that has um, a high edge to area ratio, that is not um, a very great uh, area to include in our prioritization, in our um, protected areas, because of all the edge effects uh, that are associated with, uh, with um, such shapes. So uh, think of invasive species having um, a stronger uh, effect on the edge. Uh, think of some birds, uh, some uh, some birds, if they uh, if they nest on the e edge of the habitat, they will be uh, more likely to be um, predated on. So yes, a lot of uh, negative uh, aspects uh, associated with with the uh, edge or the edge effect. Please and I. In English. I'm sorry. Please repeat in English. Edge effect. Repeat in English. Edge effect. <laughs> so I can draw something on the whiteboard. <laughs> Or maybe not. Okay. It's all about um, internal versus edge uh, habitat. So what is if we have? Sorry. Think of an area like this versus an area like this. So this one. Uh, and I don't know if in the back you can see, I just drew something skinny and with lots of lots, uh, long and uh, lots of branches and a big round blob. So um, if we have interior habitat, if we have a uh, large interior habitat, uh, uh, the uh, populations will be <sighs> sheltered from, from the negative uh, effects that are associated with the the margin or the border or the, or the edge of the habitat. So over here what we have is narrow or small area of interior habitat and long uh, uh, area of edge or border habitat. And again, at the edge of this, uh, at the edge of, this, uh, of these uh, patches, what we see is uh, easier uh, colonization by invasive species, uh, predation, um, think of raptors. Um, we have also nest parasitism in, in North America. I don't know about uh, Africa if that's, that's a big issue, but it is in, in North America is. Yes, yeah, so, 
So very, two very good points that I would have completely missed and skipped, so please, um, please uh, uh, interrupt me. Uh, here, shape, very important. We want to, to make sure that those patches that are included in, those areas that are included in the prioritization uh, result are not um, actually detrimental to the populations because of the edge effect. Um, and so since we talk, we, we uh, spent a bit of, of time on the biological criteria, um, dispersion and connectivity are also very important and that goes back to the uh, meta-population theory where we have source populations. If they don't have, is the, if the individuals don't have ways of, of accessing, dispersing into, uh, into um, uh, other patches of habitat, then our prioritization, our network of protected areas will be inefficient because we have isolated patches which the uh, target species, uh, species our conservation uh, target um, species, cannot, uh, cannot reach and uh, make use of, of those uh, protected areas. So yeah, we have to make sure that dispersion can occur and connectivity is present. Oh, and these, all these symbols, um, I didn't include the entire table, but all the symbols refer to various publications because as I said, this publication is a review of published studies. So um, uh, these symbols point you in the right direction if you are interested in, for example, the shape effect, um, uh, check that particular publication. Uh, what are, how are we doing on time? Fine, okay, okay. Okay, so the next algorithm, uh, Markzahn, is um, an interesting uh, algorithm, I think, because it, uh, it focuses on total cost of, uh, of uh, the prioritization. Um, so we design a network of protected areas uh, based on, in this particular algorithm, based on the total cost for, the, for that uh, network of protected area. Um, in addition, the, uh, any ecological targets uh, not met uh, represent a penalty uh, in, in this um, uh, algorithm. So by ecological targets, we can think of, if we go back to uh, fragmentation, uh, edge effect, um, connectivity, those could be um, examples of ecological targets. This is the equation that uh, looks complicated, but um, basically one and two are the total cost of the reserve network. So this is estimating the total cost. Number two estimates the uh, penalty for not uh, representing the conservation features. And then uh, three and four, um, reserve boundary length and, the, uh, and um, exceeding going over <laughs> going over a preset cost threshold. So if we know at the onset we have um, a certain amount of money or funding, we can set that, that would be our number four here, a, a penalty, uh, we can set that as a threshold so the algorithm must take into account the limited uh, resources we have, we have available in addition to uh, other penalties and, and costs. Um, now, what do we mean by costs in this case? We can mean anything, well, as simple as how much it costs to acquire that land. But if we don't know, a lot of times it's very hard to uh, figure out how much the land, it, the land costs uh, without a lot, of, uh, a lot of research. And the cost of land may, may actually fluctuate uh, depending when you do this. So if we don't have a good um, estimation of the monetary cost of land, we can use area of land, uh, assuming that large areas will be more expensive to acquire than, uh, than small areas. And then um, any measure of cost that is social, economic, or ecological. So ecological we already talked about, but social or economic, um, uh, you can think of uh, perhaps effects to effects on the um, uh, livelihoods of the communities, um, any kinds of social uh, social aspects of the conservation process. They can be included as costs uh, in uh, in this uh, analysis. Okay. Okay. So what the algorithm does is to go through um, uh, different possible options and 
and select the cheapest option. I know it sounds bad, but uh, the lowest cost, I should have put lowest cost option uh, that meets our, uh, our criteria. So uh, we are uh, trying to minimize cost because we, always, we are always resource uh, uh, limited. Okay, I talked about two, uh, two uh, methods, two algorithms, and about criteria that go into uh, uh, algorithms. Um, this is a good point to, uh, this is a good um, um, point in time to mention that if you're interested in this topic, there are several lectures <laughs> on this topic uh, that were covered in um, another biodiversity informatics training curriculum, uh, the, the course on data analysis. And I put the link to, to, the, to that course. Um, there, there is a lecture on zonation, which is another way of, of doing prioritization, and more information about, more theory about um, prioritization uh, criteria. So a good, very good um, uh, additional source a lot more in-depth uh, treatment of uh, prioritization. Yes? So I was just, oh, maybe you're still going to cover some of this. But I was just going to ask, um, because people in this room may not implement these uh, reserve selection algorithms personally, uh, but they might be called upon to advise somebody about what would be a good one to use. Um, what would your suggestion be in terms of the differences between, let's say, ResNet, MarkSan, and Zonation? and how pe where people might want to apply one and not the other ease of use you know yeah. consideration of different factors where's yeah I, I can't really speak <laughs> about that because i don't have experience with the three algorithms so i can't um i have very limited experience i can't really tell you which one is more complex to use i would say because it's hard for us to uh, estimate costs, at least I think it's hard to estimate costs, uh, although Markson, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing it properly, correctly, um, that algorithm se to me seems very, um, uh, with a lot of potential, but also kind of hard to use because of da the data needs we have with that algorithm. But I may be wrong about that. Okay, well, I don't know as I have great advice either, but the, from my limited knowledge of these, um, MarkSan is quite widely used, and so there are a number of uh, research groups out there with experience in MarkSan, so the one advantage of MarkSan is possibly that it's been used quite a bit, so there it's maybe a little bit easier to find people that know how to use it. Um, MarkSan can be a little bit of a black box. If you don't know well, uh, usually you won't know where all the species are that you care about, and there'll be some uncertainties. And Mark said that isn't very good at let you figuring out why it came to a, com a particular solution set. So it can be a little hard in Mark Sand to figure out, well, why did I get this answer? Is it because I put in, because I didn't have a piece of information, or because I put in a wrong piece of information and didn't realize that it, it can be a little hard to sort of backtrack and figure out how it got you where you are. Um, Zonation, I don't know very well, but one thing to say about zonation is it works kind of in the opposite way that MarkSan does. MarkSan is kind of like a greedy algorithm where it adds things, adds the next most valuable thing to arrive at the areas that you'd want to put in your reserve network. Zonation does it the other way around. It throws things out. It says, well, what's least valuable? What areas can we throw out? And then sort of whittles down to things. Uh, but I don't know, and Tom might have an opinion, I don't particularly know whether one of those approaches is better than the other. Kumara? <coughs> oh, sorry. Uh, bec <coughs> because uh, donation is uh, a very important suite. So is there any criteria which is maybe standardized to do donation? Yeah, what are the key elements which shouldn't be left out when you do donation inside the, the protected area? I'm going to go over that. <laughs> OK. Oh. He you were going to? He speaks loud enough that it, you, you okay. don't okay. need to okay. run okay. down the uh, First, I was just going to, you may be about to say the same thing. The first thing we should explain, and I'm sorry I didn't 
is zonation is just the name of a computer algorithm to select protected areas. It actually doesn't, maybe you could use it for zonation, but it's typically not used to zone protected areas. So even though it has that name, it doesn't, doesn't really have to do with zonation, I think. Uh, and in terms of systematic zonation, sort of maybe decision support tools, I don't know of any, but I'm not sure. I don't know enough about it. It's an interesting question. That's a, it's actually, you know, as it becomes harder and harder to add new protected areas, it's much more relevant to have some decision support for how you zone within what you've got than to try to add new things. So uh, it's probably a point that us academics should take on board. <laughs> so just to give a little bit of commentary kind of from outside, I'm, I'm certainly the person here who's used these things the least. Um, but what I've seen is that each time I talk to one of the proponents of each of these algorithms, I get a different view of what is the best. I've seen some things that I really like. For example, ResNet is, in its more advanced in implementations, it's very much able to include multiple costings. Mm -hmm. So for example, buying land right now might cost this much, but buying land in 20 years might cost that much. And I may have different sets of constraints and different sets of priorities on a one-year time scale versus a 10-year time scale mm -hmm. or a 100-year time scale. So I really like that flexibility. Um, zonation, we had a whole day-long uh, mini course on that. Um, seems like it was quite flexible and quite easy to explore. But whenever I hear people kind of absolutely saying, oh, this is the best, don't worry about those others, um, my tendency is I don't want to rely on any one of them, especially with my outsider perspective. If I were getting ready to you know, do a place, place prioritization al uh, analysis for Cameroon, I would get my data together and find the way to do the ideal op analysis with several of these tools. And if I get the same answer or similar answers, fine. You know, Lee just told you how one goes kind of from the full set down and the other goes kind of grabbing areas and builds up. Well, those in these complex optimization algorithms, that can give you very different endpoints. So it really depends on how, how complex the analysis is. Are there, you know, if I make an early decision in this direction, does that eliminate a world of, of possible solutions? Whereas if I'd made that early step in that direction, maybe, maybe I don't see these other solutions. So I would certainly, again, I personally, would certainly take one data set and play with various of these algorithms. Okay, I think that would be something where you would come to an understanding. If it's a pretty simple analysis at the end of the day, then all of these algorithms will converge on similar solutions. But if it's something that's really complex that could, that could get to quite a bit of of multiple similar solutions, then you really have to get into the guts of it and really have to understand the details. So that's just my, my view from outside. Uh, one uh, detail that I, or piece of information that I forgot to provide is that, so I, I, I mentioned ResNet, um, the and I can't remember. I think that I think the uh, guidelines for ResNet were published in maybe 2002. I don't remember exactly. But the next iteration of ResNet is ConsNet, uh, and the guidelines were published sometime 2006 or 8. Unfortunately, I I have not found uh, papers that have used ConsNet recently. So it looks like ResNet is still. Um, still the version, the earlier version of, of this algorithm 
seems to be uh, the preferred one. So there, if, you, if you look into this, you, you may come across both ResNet and ConsNet, but ResNet seems to have more of a uh, follower, uh, a group of followers. Okay, any other, yes, questions? <coughs> 